On July 19, 1977, the world teacher, the Christ Maitreya, head of the spiritual hierarchy, emerged from his ancient retreat and is now in the modern world. With his disciples, the masters of the wisdom, he will inaugurate the new age of synthesis and brotherhood. Good morning and welcome to our World Teacher Program on Wellington's Access Radio 783 AM presented by Teresa and David on behalf of Share International New Zealand. In the previous three programs we have read about the reappearance of the World Teacher Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom. We have touched upon who Maitreya is and his teachings and we have learned that UFOs are manned by our space brothers from other planets. They are harmless and here to help humanity. Now, in today's program, we have a look at ourselves, who we are and why we are here. How can we create a harmonious life through the understanding of certain laws which govern our lives? How, eventually, we will understand that our thoughts, words and actions create our life from moment to moment and with that awareness we will finally know ourselves and to quote Gandhi be the change you want to see in the world there are four great laws which govern our life whether we realize it or not they are the law of cause and effect or karma the law of rebirth or reincarnation the law of harmlessness and the law of sacrifice to explain further here are Benjamin Krem's comments on his master's article entitled The Laws of Life from October 1983. When we look at our world today, we see almost nothing but wrong relationships. If you have wrong relationships, you have conditioning. If you have conditioning, you have wars. All the wars, the suffering, the inability of humanity to demonstrate itself as souls in incarnation, are the result of conditioning. Yet no one need be conditioned. Every single human being is conditioned by the past, by its parents, by the very nature of its vehicles, which have been created for it by its soul under the law of karma. That great law determines the physical nature, the emotional coloration and the mental factor of that individual. Karma brings it about and allows it to create right relationships in its short demonstration. We used to say 70 years, but it's a bit longer now. However short or long the life, it gives the person the opportunity to address the issues, to redress the wrongs done in the past and to resolve them, and therefore to make better human relationships in a particular life. We come into incarnation over and over again to enable us to right the wrongs of the past, our wrongs, not the wrongs of other people. Very few people in the West believe in reincarnation, although a growing number of people accept it as an intellectual idea, possibly true. They do not quite know what it means, but they say, maybe in my last life I was a cat. That is why I like cats so much. That is the understanding of Western people on reincarnation. In the East, millions of people have accepted reincarnation as part of the nature of their lives, but even they have not understood how that great law works. Life proceeds under law. Simple and obvious as it appears, it is something which has been left out of the equation. How many people, how many philosophers writing about the meaning and purpose of life write about reincarnation as one of the laws, the great law of life. It is only in the esoteric teaching that the law of karma, the law of cause and effect, is realized for what it is. Jesus put it very simply, as you sow, so shall you reap. It could not be put more simply, and you would think more understandably. As you sow, whether in a cornfield or not, you will reap what you have sown in good soil with good seed if you are lucky with the weather 
then you get a good crop. If you sow bad seed and do not prepare the soil properly, you are going to get a poor crop. It is very simple. He put it that way because his audience were farmers and would know what he meant. But he is talking about the law of karma absolutely clearly. He put it so neatly that nobody takes it very seriously. Just one of those truisms which are not lived in practice. The law of karma, the law of cause and effect, is the great law governing all of our existence. Every thought, every action we make sets into motion a cause. The effects stemming from these causes make our lives for good or ill. We do it to ourselves. Because this law substands the human condition on planet Earth, we are bound by it. There is nothing we can do about it except be harmless. If you are harmless, you obey the law. If you create right action, therefore, from right action can come only right reaction. But nine times out of ten, given the chance, humanity has created wrong action. We have always made wars. We have always stolen. We have always been greedy, selfish and complacent. All these actions which make up humanity's stock in trade are destructive. Hence the fact that we have a world that is destructive. We have a world of earthquakes, floods, tsunamis and other catastrophes. We have air crashes, train crashes, car crashes and all the horrors of the physical plane. We know disease, we are killed by it, we are inhibited by it, we quickly age by it. Disease is the result of our wrong thought and action and the wrong thought and action of our progenitors because we inherit the tendency to one disease or another through our genetic framework. There are many horrible iniquities in the world, terrible pain and suffering, disease and drug abuse, the use we make of other people, the unbelievable intolerance we have for other nationalities, other colours of men. We think that we are quite well educated, well evolved. Obviously we are not. I believe it would take my trier to show humanity this iniquity, to show just how pressingly horrible it is. So what can we do? It is obvious that we have to create harmlessness in every situation, in all relationships. When we create harmlessness in all relationships, we will find that the world is an easier, better, kinder, more harmonious place in which to live. The masters see humanity as having reached a point where they have the readiness to learn. That is why the masters are here. We have invoked them by being ready as never before to follow the precepts of the masters and to create harmony and justice. When humanity can create equilibrium in all aspects of its life, then we will know we are creating right human relationships. Right human relationships are harmless and in equilibrium. Equilibrium is balancing. There are many factors in life and you have to bring them together, like many factors in a painting or a sculpture. Life is life when it is in equilibrium. When it is not in equilibrium, it is either destructive or static on the point of dying. Static life is only static for a fraction of a second. The status quo is the last moment, but you are already out of the last moment. So there is no such thing as the status quo. There is always movement, and that movement is seeking stability. It is seeking unity, another word for equilibrium. Likewise, all people are seeking unity. Underlying the search for meaning in the life of everybody is the search for unity. They want to be part of the group, of the human existence, because they are souls. They are already divine and the nature of divinity is unity. There are countless millions of manifestations of that divinity in the universe, but the nature of the absolute divinity from which it all came is unified, unmoving, endless, eternal, never changing. That is behind each one of us. As Maitreya puts it, that is the being of humanity. The becoming is what happens when that takes the form of living. 
we go through the process of evolution, that is the becoming. Essentially, we are the self, which is the divine. Divinity, when we grasp it, when we understand it, recognize it, gives us the experience of what we call life. That is the meaning and essentially the purpose of who and what we are. You're listening to the World Teacher Program on Wellington's Access Radio, 7.83 a.m. Benjamin Krem continues, I've talked about the law of karma, the law of rebirth and the law of harmlessness, but the law of sacrifice is perhaps more difficult to understand. The great law of sacrifice is the very nature of evolution. We proceed in evolution through the sacrifice, always within ourselves, of the lower to the higher. The soul's bodies of expression physical, astral-emotional and mental, are vehicles. Maitreya calls them the temples of the self, through which the self can see and watch the evolution of the soul in incarnation, the becoming of ourselves as gods. That process is done by refining the matter of the physical, astral-emotional and mental equipment, refining them each life a little more bringing into them more and more light, that is, subatomic particles of matter. As the bodies gradually change, the nature and demands of the physical body change, likewise those of the astral emotional body and finally of the mental body also change. Each change registers, for the self watching this process, a shifting of status of a man or woman coming into incarnation through the laws of karma and rebirth, working under the law of harmlessness and undergoing the process of the law of sacrifice. Each shift in the quality of energy of the physical, astral or mental bodies marks a degree of change which is a sacrifice because the lower is always sacrificed for the higher. Any evolutionary advance is achieved only through the sacrifice of some lower aspect. It is impossible to evolve and to remain the same at the same time. We either advance and change or we do not advance. Every advance that we make is the result of a sacrifice of the lower. The desires and demands of the physical body, the attachments and desires of the emotional body, the conditioning of the mental body. The sense of the separated self has to disappear. When the ultimate demand, a complete sacrifice of the sense of self, happens, we are saved. That is what salvation is, taking it out of a religious connotation. That is something which each of us has to do for ourselves. That is the ultimate goal of the evolution of humanity on this planet. Then we are a master. We are freed from this planet forever. We are free from the pull of matter forever. This bringing of light into the vehicle time after time is like dying to the past and being reborn to the future. The future being that which takes you along the evolutionary cycle to salvation or perfectionment. 
This is what perfectionment is, and it is always achieved by sacrifice. The great law of sacrifice is basic to the evolutionary process. That is hard for a lot of people to contemplate because they think sacrifice is something painful. But sacrifice of that kind happens. You do not count the amount of light, subatomic particles coming in and say, it's getting to a point where it is quite painful. But you do realise in your life that things are never the same. You die to what engaged your attention before. You die to what was a need before. You die to the demands of the physical body. You die to the demands and illusions of the astral body, to the paucity and narrowness of the mental body, because you are reaching higher and higher beyond these vehicles. The soul is imbuing you with more and more subatomic particles, therefore light, and that is making you rarer. It is purifying, rarefying the vehicles of your body. The demands of the lower vehicles become less pronounced, and the demands of the soul become more pronounced. All you are doing really is replacing earth light by soul light. Matter is relatively inert and cumbersome, but of course you cannot work without it. You must go through evolution. It is something you need, but are always refining. As you evolve, these vehicles are always being refined by more and more subatomic light, and that is the sacrifice. It is not really a sacrifice, but it is occultly a sacrifice. You sacrifice the lower matter to the higher light, and you eventually become a master. Something we have to look forward to. We have to learn the art of living. It is an art form and can only be learned as we go. It is not something that you can teach, but you can teach the rudiments, the laws. Teach the laws and the rules which stem from them. The law of cause and effect, the law of rebirth, the law of harmlessness, and the law of sacrifice. And you have taught the basics of life. Life proceeds under these laws, and the sooner we make them instinctive parts of our life, the sooner we will have a reasonably coordinated and harmonic life and world. It is a world filled today with anxiety and fear. The nature of life should be the very opposite. One day, with the help of Maitreya and the Masters, it will be so. Coming into the world relatively soon is the great fourth ray, the ray of harmony through conflict. We know plenty about the conflict, we are going through the conflict. The fourth ray of harmony controls the human kingdom. It is the governing ray of humanity. By its nature it creates the conditions necessary for fast human evolution, conflict and for harmony as a result of that conflict. That great ray is always in manifestation as far as humanity is concerned. But in a few years from now it will enter a major cycle and will stimulate all life on the planet to an extraordinary degree. Also coming in is the great seventh ray under the Aquarian dispensation. This combination of four and seven is unique. It is wonderful. It supplies all that we need in the form of harmony and structure. This will have a tremendous impact on humanity. The seventh ray grounds the spiritual ideal. It anchors on the physical plane the energy of synthesis pouring in from Aquarius through Maitreya who will focus it into the world. This will have a colossal impact, is already having an impact, drawing people together, drawing nations together. These powerful cosmic forces are doing their work and will continue to do their work. They will draw humanity into a synthesis, a blended, fused oneness. People will know the unity they are searching for because the nature of that oneness is unity. They will have true equilibrium. We are all seeking balance. We are seeking unity, equilibrium, however we define it. It is that which allows us to be creative and happy. It allows the will to turn again and again, and create out of itself, and again out of itself, 
that which is created. In that way, the civilization of the future will demonstrate qualities we cannot even begin to talk about. We do not have the words for what we will see and know. We do not have words for the quality of that civilization, nor for the feeling, the experience of that relationship when all people see and experience themselves as brothers and sisters of one home, one planet. That will take people back to the experience of childhood. Home was home. Your brothers and sisters were the staff that kept you on the right track. So it will be. We will truly depend on each other. An interdependent world will be a reality. It is today a reality, but we do not recognize the fact. In this coming time, the constructions, the inventions, the extraordinary discoveries latent, yet just beyond us at the present moment, will become realities. We will unleash them through the correct relationship, leisure, education, recognition in the world for the first time that we are souls in incarnation on a journey of exploration together, creating the artifacts of that civilization and demonstrating that we are gods. What it really means is that we together as a people, a group called humanity, will give expression to our inner reality as gods. The soul will express itself. The self through our life will envelop all people. We will see all people as the soul. We will see that there is only one self and that we all share identity with that self. Maitreya is here to help us to see that, to teach us how to become that which we are. And now we'll read the article that Benjamin Krem based this commentary on, entitled The Art of Living, It Begins. Before long, a great change will take place in our approach to life. Out of the chaos of the present time will emerge a new understanding of the meaning underlying our existence and every effort will be made to express our awareness of that meaning in our daily lives. This will bring about a complete transformation of society. A new livingness will characterize our relationships and institutions. A new freedom and sense of joy will replace the present fear. Above all else, mankind will come to realize that living is an art based on certain laws, requiring the function of the intuition for correct expression. Harmlessness is the key to the new beauty in relationship which will emerge. A new sense of responsibility for actions and thoughts will guide each one in every situation. An understanding of the law of cause and effect will transform men's approach to each other. A new, more harmonious interaction between men and nations will supplant the present competition and distrust. Gradually, mankind will learn the art of living, bringing to each moment the experience of the new. No longer will men live in fear of the future and of each other. No longer will millions starve or carry the burden of labour for their brothers. Each one has a part to play in the complex pattern being woven by humanity. Each contribution is uniquely valuable and necessary to the whole. However dim as yet the spark, there is no one in whom the fire of creativity cannot be lit. The art of living is the art of giving expression to that creative fire and so revealing the nature of men as potential gods. It is essential that all men share in this experience and learn the art of living. Until now, a truly creative life has been the privilege of the few. In this coming time, the untapped creativity of millions will add a new luster to the achievements of man. Emerging from the darkness of exploitation and fear, in true and correct relationship, each man will find within himself the purpose and the joy of living. The presence of the Christ and the Masters will speed this process, inspiring humanity to saner and safer methods of advance. A new simplicity will distinguish the coming civilization under the guidance of these knowers of God. 
Already there is a growing sense that all is not well in man's estate. More and more men are becoming aware of the limitations of their lives and search for something better. They question the modes and structures which inhibit participation in the fullness of life and long for meaning and purpose in all that they do. Shortly new energies will enter our lives and inspire men to creative action. A new and harmonious stimulus will be given to art and the art of living. A beauty not seen before will transform the ways of men and illumine for all time the nature of God. Man stands now ready for revelation. His heart and mind poised and turned to the future, he awaits the glory which by readiness he has invoked. And that concludes our program today on Wellington's Access Radio 783 AM. Our next one will be on Saturday the 22nd of April at the usual time of 10 AM. For more information please call us on 06 36461. That number again is 06 36461. To ask for our monthly free of charge newsletter, to inquire about Mr. Krem's books or to subscribe to the Share International magazine, the number is 04 234 1133. That's 04 234 1133. Or write to P.O. Box 9576 Wellington. Alternatively, visit the website share-international.org. You have been listening to Teresa and David on behalf of Share International New Zealand. You can listen again to this program or previous ones online at accessradio.org.nz. Click on Programs and scroll down to the World Teacher link. Thank you.